Well, praise the Lord. I wanted to add to that, um, this is the first conference that we actually went to over at, at, at Living Word Church. And I know that he has, there's a women's conference coming up. It's about five and a half hours. It's not a terrible drive. We do go, we went through Canada. You don't have to, obviously. It's in the peninsula, whatever you call it, up in upper Michigan. And so, but we were thinking to make sure that we let you guys know if there's something coming up, maybe we could go as a group. We could take a car, two cars. If anyone has the time or they have the finances or they just want to get away and go to, you know, whatever. I know there's a women's conference coming up. I don't think a men's, but he has different conferences. And we can also stream them. But it's good sometimes to get away and get into another house and just to bask in God's presence and be, you know, with other believers, isn't it? And, and again, we haven't had our pastor here yet. We've had talks about it, and we will get him here. I, I know we will get him here this year, and uh, then you guys can meet him personally, so that'll be, that'll be real fun. Trust us, though. He's a good man of God and great to have. Uh, it's interesting because out of all the people that he pastors and out of all the leaders that he pastors, if I text, and I got this from someone else too, if I text him or I, I try to call him, he answers. He answers my texts. He has time. He has a heart for the church. You know, he is now, after 40 years of ministry, God you know, has asked him to go on television. So they're on Believer's Voice of Victory. You can catch him on there as well. But he fought God on that and because he has a heart for the local church. He has other preacher friends who said, why don't you just travel and just preach to preachers? He says, because I love the church. And he wants to strengthen the end times church. And so just a great man of God. You guys are going to love him. He's hilarious, um, authoritative, but just a good man of God. I can't wait till we get him here, but if we it takes a while to get him here, then let's go there, you know? So I will keep you posted and if there's anything coming up. Amen? Amen. So, Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Anybody recognize this? This is a rare thing. It's a rare thing. Um, you know, it... It's next to, well, it's not next to being extinct because the Word of God will never go extinct. You can burn them all and they'll still be produced. They're still in your heart. The Holy Ghost, it's alive and powerful, but I'm being funny. But, you know, in a day and age when we have all the electronics, and I have no, no qualm about that, but for me personally, I'm bringing my Bible. Uh, today, the scriptures, this is not personal. This was not planned, but I didn't have time. They won't be on the screen. So I'm going to read them to you. So I hope you have a device or a Bible. I'm asking you as our church, I feel convicted a little bit personally, and I don't want to put any burden on you, but I feel like a little bit of an injustice is happening by us not bringing our Bibles or electronic devices. I got no problem with that. Um, yeah, I don't mind. I have it all right here. I have these scriptures in here, and I'm going to read from here today. I personally am pulling this out and trying to get into the book a little bit more. I also use my electronic Bible all the time. There's devotions and such. But if, as churches continue to grow and we continue to do things, and we just put scriptures up, there's no turning to the scriptures anymore. There's no, I was telling her, I said, yeah, do you remember when we were new Christians? And they would say John 13, 12 or whatever. And, I mean, it was times I'd fumble for five minutes trying to... They'd be on three verses later, and I'm still trying to find John. It was embarrassing. It was, it, was, it was a little embarrassing. It was hard, but we grew. You know, and anything that is worth, is worth doing, it'll grow you. It's worth doing, you know. And so bring your Bible if you have one. Let's be word people. I mean, that doesn't mean having a Bible, but we're word people. But bring your Bible if you have one. Let's start using it. Or your electronic device... I'm not decided yet. We have the screens. We'll probably still put them up. But I want us to, to use these and, and get familiar. And, and is there something about reading along? I remember, you know, when I read, the, I used to read just this before, electronic Bibles. Um, I couldn't, I was never good at memorizing scripture. Still, I'm still not. And so I'm not a person that can say, oh, that's an Ezekiel, whatever. You know, I just can't usually pull it out. But I could used to be able to remember where it was in the book and where it was on the page, right? Like I knew it was on the right page at the very top corner, and that would help me to find it. Well, that came from what? Opening up and studying it. So that said, God, we thank you for this Bible. We thank you for the Word of God. Father, there are those in parts of the world that 
don't have the privilege of having the Word of God in paper form or electronic form. So we are so grateful, God, that we do. We're thankful that we have it, and we're thankful, God, that they have the same spirit, though, Lord, that is able to quicken them to the Scriptures. But, Lord, we praise you. We thank you for this Word this morning. I ask, God, that you would cause this Word to be just awakened in people's hearts. Let their hearts receive, Lord, what it is that you have to say this morning. And I thank you, God, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Who's thankful for God's word this morning? Amen. Amen. And, you know, it's the word of God that that we're able to to live and and to breathe and and have our life. Amen. It's the word of God that quickens us, that, that brings faith to us. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and by hearing by the word of God. And so it's when the word is preached, the scriptures go on to say that when the word is preached and when it's spoken, there's something about it. And and this is not referring to our physical ears. This is referring to your spiritual ear. There's something that happens when the word is spoken, not necessarily preached, but spoken. It quickens your your heart and brings faith to the hearer. That's powerful. The only book in the world... That's sharper than any two-edged sword, able to separate spirit from soul and bone from marrow. There is no other book in the world that's able to do that. There's no other book that has the oracles or or literally the prophetic. This is the prophetic words of God. This is the book that we base our, our whole walk on. It's our foundation. Jesus is our foundation, but what is Jesus? He is the Word, (laughs) and so our foundation is the Word of God. This is the word that we dig out scriptures and and we find scriptures for the seasons and the days and the hour and the times that we're in when we're struggling and and maybe we're struggling with a health issue and we can pull out Psalms 91. We can read about how Jesus took stripes on his back for our healing and we can pull out truths, truths that are alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, not just a good book, not just a story, not just a, a story that I would read to my kids. I'm so excited that the, there's people sitting in every section this morning. <laughs> I'm so excited that it's like evenly distributed. I, it feels good. It feels good. But we're living in that hour when, uh, as I was just talking about those two clouds, we're living in that hour of darkness and gross darkness covering the earth. And if you don't think that we're living in that hour, then all you need to do is turn on the news All you need to do is get on the internet. I don't think I need to convince, I know you guys are great saints, I don't need to convince any of you of what gross darkness looks like in the hour that we're living in. But we're also living in an hour that said that there would be a a famine in the land. A famine of the word of God. And Doc was teaching a little bit on that and back in the day when God revealed that to him through the word, it's in the scriptures. Um, that in the last days there would, there would be a famine of the word, he thought, his interpretation was there'd be less preachers. There'd be less preachers in the pulpit, less men and women of God declaring the oracles of God. And it was later on that God declared to him what it, what it actually meant. See, we're living in the, also in the hour that you can heap up for yourself a pile of preachers. There is no lack of preachers and teachers in the kingdom. In fact, if you go on the Facebook, there's a pastor, apostle, and a prophet. Everyone's a prophet, so-and-so, an apostle, somebody, a pastor this, a pastor that. They're everywhere. Churches are in abundance. It's electronically, it's on TV, on the internet. There are preachers everywhere, but we're living in the hour that there is a drought for the truth and the word of God because we are living in the hour that people would turn away from sound doctrine and turn towards fables and stories. They would heap up for themselves preachers, piles of preachers that would tickle their ears. And we're living in an hour, let me tell you, when you're living in an hour of gross darkness, when you're living in an hour that that darkness is covering the land, you're in need of faith-filled preachers and teachers that will open up this book and declare it to you and give it to you straightforward. We're in need of more people that would just not hold back and, and not be afraid to tell you something, even if it hurts you just a little bit. Yep. Because no chastening of the Lord feels good at the moment, but we know it, later it yields the peaceable fruit of God. we got to have it. 
And one of the other things that kind of scares me as a pastor, and I know it's not happening here, God forbid, but um, I think there's a lot of people that are finding they're feeding maybe once a week by coming to church, maybe only on Sunday. We're living in an hour where it's hard for people to come to church even four times a month. And they're not opening their electronic Bible or their Bible at all during the week. Get up in the morning and they're on social media, first thing. I've done it. Facebook. What are we filling ourselves up with? You know, you can get up in the morning now and you can turn on the news or social media and you can fill yourself up with fear about this coronavirus, right? I mean, you could fill yourself up. Or you can open up your Bible and fill yourself up with the Word of God and the promises about how God is fighting for you, how God took stripes for your healing, how God will go before you and how His glory will be your rear guard. You can open up this book and... And, and just find out exactly what God has to say to you. You can build up your most holy faith by getting in there. Amen? Amen? By praying. So don't neglect the Word of God. Be in the Word of God. Feed yourself daily. You know, I think about uh, bodybuilders. I used to exercise quite a bit more. Not as much now. I could probably use some. But I knew, and I think we could all say this, that if I wanted to achieve certain goals that I need to put myself on a certain regimen of certain exercises, of certain reps, of certain, you know. Yeah. If I want to be 245 pounds of muscle and tone up and so on and so forth, we know what we got to do. And I think about people who may only be feeding only on Sunday, getting the word. How anorexic spiritually they are. I, 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 we wouldn't survive if we ate, if, if we all ate one meal a week. How would we be? Not too good. <laughs> and so don't rely on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever all the other things are to give you your feeding for the week. And get out the word of God. Get around other believers. Get out your, uh, yourself out of bed and pray. Amen. Ask God. Ask him to speak to you. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Sing songs. Praise him. I'm going to be turning to John 1. A lot, of, a lot of you, this might be familiar. Some of you, it might be new. But John 1, 1 through 18, I'm going to read out of the book. It's good. It's nice and bright. Big. Oh, I've always had giant letters because I, I could never see. So that's always a bonus. That's another reason I like the electronics because you can <laughs> blow it up. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that were made through him, or excuse me, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That's powerful. I think I hit on this word in the last couple of weeks, but this word here for comprehend means attain, comprehend, uh, to overpower to take control. So at first reading, I used to read that, that as that the darkness did not understand, which is part of the translation, so don't take this wrong. But as I read in deeper into the Strong's Concordance, it revealed to me that the darkness could not take control over. It could not obtain. It could not do anything against. In other words, darkness had nothing on light, right? There was nothing that darkness could do to overtake the light. The light came into the world, and the darkness was like, well, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> We're powerless. And we all have heard in, in the past, and I'll just say it again, but when all the lights are off in this building, it's dark. And we could turn on the lights, and what happens to the darkness? It's gone. It disperses. It flees. It's even been said that darkness is just merely the absence of light. That's pretty powerful. But even a candle has enough illumination to light your path to be able to get around a room. Isn't that cool? But it pierces the darkness. But darkness can't be turned on over light. Is there a switch right now that we can turn on to? Who's doing the lights? Keith, can we turn on the darkness switch? Is there a switch that we can flip that the darkness would overpower the light? 
No? Hmm. That's interesting. So the only way for the darkness to overpower the light is for us to turn off the light. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, darkness is only merely the absence of light. Praise the Lord. Where were we? Six. It was a man, a man sent from God whose name was John, and this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. Now he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Hallelujah. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Isn't that interesting? That Jesus came into the world, and the world literally was made through him. Almost like the world was a part of him, but the world didn't recognize him. Because he wasn't of the world. Amen? He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Hallelujah. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. And so I, as I've been studying this and looking into some old familiar scriptures, I was asking myself, why was life in Christ? And I begin to like kind of dig in and, and look at these verses and try to, to dig them out a little bit and figure out what exactly what was going on. And, and uh, I wrote down, that's a good question. Well, because Jesus was the anointed one. He was literally the word of God incarnate or the word of God in the flesh. And this is, this is kind of, I, I, what I'm going to share with you today is going to be so simple, but we're going to go really far and try to, it's going to be a little profound. It's going to probably might confuse us all a little only to get back to a simple point. I was thinking about that this morning, like, why am I going like this just to say the same thing that we already kind of knew? But we're going to do it anyway. Praise the Lord, because it's the Word of God and we want to look at it. And so the Word of God incarnate or in the flesh, He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. He was and is the door or the sheep gate. He is our propitiation, which means mercy seat. And the list goes on and on and on. He has many names. But what I want to focus on this morning was the Word dwelt among us. The Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. Now, this fascinates me. This, this is very interesting to me that we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But, you know, we have God's Word, and God's Word we know in the beginning God spoke, right? He said, let, it, let there be light, and so on and so forth. And he went through the, the six days of creation, and he spoke things into existence. This was God's word going forth. Are you with me? So as God spoke, his word went out. And there was life was in the word. Are you with me? Jesus is the word. So I want you to get a clear picture of this. So I'm going to say a few words. I need a couple volunteers. I'm not going to pick on you because you're just too easy to pick on. All right, uh, Jacob, I'm going to give you the word the. Okay, you got the. The world. You got world. Was filled with Gus Light. All right, everybody remember their word? I don't know who, oh, go ahead. With light. All right. So you guys just spoke my words. Okay? No big deal. That whole sentence had no meaning in this message. I just made up some words. But what I want you to see is that God gave personality. He impersonated his words. He, he sent his word to become flesh. So as I asked you to repeat my words, so my words go out and they're sort of, they just go out and they bounce around. You hear them, then they die, whatever, however all that works, the senses and sounds and all that. So God decided, though, to, to make his word a person, incarnate. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created in him, by him, and through him. They were one. And then God sent his word to us. 
and he became a living being. And so we see, like, why? So the question was, why was life in Christ? Well, he was the Word of God. Life has to be in Christ. And I remember the scriptures where Christ said, my will, or my food, is to do what? The will of my Father. He didn't have, well, I guess because God made him a person, he had free will and choice. But it was God's word. And so when God sent forth his word, now I don't have exact scripture to lock this down, and I'm not trying to be fruity and weird this morning or confuse you. But when God said, let there be, it's in my opinion, um, this is my opinion, that the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Word of God, was kind of like the thing that carried that out by the power of the Holy Spirit. All three working as one. God's Word went forth. And so we read about Emmanuel, God with us. They were all one but separate. So God's Word became flesh. God literally came to the earth. He came as the form of a man. It was almost like God himself came. And we can read scriptures and back that up too. That God himself came and he made himself a propitiation, a mercy seat for our sins. But life, if we back up, it says, in him, now we're talking about the word. This is in John, I think, verse 3. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I always read that as, I always read that as Jesus is the light. And then I was reading this the other day, and it was like, in him was life, and that life was the light of man. Now, we could say that it's Jesus, so he is life, and he is light. I know it's getting weird. I don't just hold on, okay? Let's try to stay with me. It's really not that deep. I'm just breaking down some scriptures, only to get to the point that Jesus was the word and that he walked with us. And so he had life within him. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. I looked into the Strong's Concordance, and, and light there means light. Go figure. But it means uh, to expose. It means to, like, rays of sunshine. It means firelight. And so, you know, it's a way that it could be related back then. Obviously, they didn't have light bulbs, but fire gave light to people so they could see where they were going. It gave them warmth. It gave them things that they needed. They could put it on a stick and walk through a dark cave. Amen. And so he was the firelight, and that life was the light of men. Now, quite frankly, Jesus was and is the word of God, which is the life, is life for man, which makes him the light of men. In Matthew 4.4, 4, uh, referring also to Deuteronomy 8.3, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. You remember that when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Strong's Concordance word, G2198, for live, is life, live, quickened, or lively. So in other words, man shall not live by only bread, but man shall live by every word. The word of God that brings life, that makes you lively. The word of God quickens you. It, it, it shoots up inside you. I think it was, maybe it was Jeremiah that said, your word has shot up in me like a fire in my bones. That he couldn't even keep quiet. He had to speak because God's word is, is living and it's powerful. And it shot up inside him and it brings life. It brings power. It brings clarity. It brings direction. It also exposes because it's the life of the word that is also the light of men. So it exposes the hidden deeds of darkness. It exposes that which has been hidden, but it also reveals and shows the path that you should take and go on. The life which is in Christ is the light of man. It shines and illuminates and it makes manifest. It's the fire light, or in other words, it lights the way and makes clear. God's word, or the life that's in Jesus, makes manifest the will of God. This is the life that was in Christ. Now, jumping ahead, we know that, you know, as Jesus came into this world, he was the Savior, he was, he was prophesied about that he would come and that there would, God would make a way. And he came and he did make a way and he became our mercy seat. And in our faith in him, we're able to be forgiven, we're able to be saved. We just read that that if we, by our faith in Jesus Christ, that he gives us the power to become children of God. Amen? Amen? 
But to take it one step further, Jesus said in Matthew 3.11, I, or excuse me, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who come, is coming after me, he is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not even worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That word there, fire, means lightning fire. It means fiery fire. He said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fiery fire. He'll baptize you with lightning fire. It's the fire of God. It's the light of God that brings life. It's the light of men. And that's the kind of fire that he's poured out inside of you. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he said that he would baptize you with God's very own spirit and with fire. Amen. You are now the light which illuminates. Is that cool? When Jesus walked this earth and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, even though it was all created by him, through him, for him, and the world did not recognize him, the life that was in him was the light of men. Jesus is the light of man. He still is. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But once you accepted him and he gave you the power to become a child of God, then he filled you with the Holy Spirit and fiery fire. You are now that light source. You are now a light unto the world. You are now the one that the world is looking unto. See, they, they're looking unto Jesus also, just like you and I, the author and finisher of our faith. We're looking unto Jesus. You're looking unto Jesus. They're also looking for hope. They're just looking for hope in all the wrong places, or love in all the wrong places. I'm not going to start singing. <laughs> but you and I, we are that hope. Why? Because that hope lives and breathes inside of you and me baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In other words, you're baptized with light. That life that was in Jesus, that life that is Jesus, that gave light to men is now in you. You are walking about this world as little lights, as little people that, that are mini Christ or little anointed ones. Amen. After all, you and I are part of what? The body of Christ. Right? Amen. That fire inside of me is drying my mouth out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you for water. I used to think, you know, it sounds arrogant to, to think like, well, you're little anointed ones. Or, you, you know, my wife preached one time. It was really on the edge of, can, can this be? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> look, sure. look, little Christ's. Understand we know who Christ is. We know he's the king. We know he's Lord. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're his servants. We're in him. You know, it's not like we're offering anything to him that he needs. He's offering it all to us. Amen. But in this world, God has ordained it. He has set it up that the world would look for hope. They would look for answers. And they're supposed to be looking at the church. And you know what? They're having a hard time finding answers because the church lately, at large, most of the church, you remember that church where I said there's an abundance of preachers that you can well up and you can have piles of preachers that are no longer putting out the truth, but they're putting out fables and tales and stories and telling you it's okay. You can have your best life now. That's not the scriptures. God wants you prosperous. God wants you healed. I'm a faith man. God wants you, you know, to have the, the, the good things of this world and in the one to come. But God also will send you through every trial he needs to, to equip you, to get you ready, to, to, to get you fitted for the calling and, the, and what he has for you in this life and where you're going. Amen. Not all of us are called to the same thing. Now, now hear me. When it comes to salvation... Our worth is equal across the board. We, we, we are all equals. But not all walk with the same authority or have the same calling. And that just means more are, is required of some and greater judgment will fall on some. The Bible says be careful what you ask for. But this world is looking. you know. And, and now I watch these people running, groves of people running to the modern day church. And, and, it, and it's, 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 it's almost like going to a concert. You know, when I was younger, I remember going to Ozzy concerts. Yeah, I was heavy metal. You know, crazy concerts and stuff, smokes and fireworks. I mean, this is happening in church now. And I'm a, I'm a, you guys know me. I'm a big component of having, like this video, some things, and we use them for the glory of God. 
I think you can have all of the bells and whistles so long as the preacher is still preaching, as long as the preacher, the man or woman of God, is still adhering to the truth of God, still following the leading of the Holy Ghost, and still laying it out there like they're supposed to do. If they begin compromising and watering down, they have no authority. I have no authority to change this book. I have no authority to give you something that's not in this book. I have no authority to preach to you, and that's why I said this is my opinion, because it wasn't in here. Thank you. Give the Lord an amen. amen. We're in an hour now where there is a famine for truth, a famine for the word of God, and you need to filter all that you hear. That's right. Because you can turn on the TV, go on the internet, and you've got preachers left and right. They're all over the place. I remember sitting one time, my, my wife and I went to visit a church locally around this area, not in this town, so don't, don't get any church in your head. <laughs> they had a guest anyway from out of state, so it doesn't matter who they were. But we went to visit this church, and, and, and it was, you know, a, a little Pentecostal, and I got nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. We were dancing and hollering, singing, clapping. It was, it was a good time. And while all this was going on, the man was throwing out tidbits of truths, tidbits, you know, little, little timbits, little nuggets, <laughs> little donut holes of truth. But while the worship, you know, you've been in services like that, throwing out little things. And we're amening, clapping, laughing, teeheeing, having a good time. And we're, and all at the same time, doctrine, Mormon doctrine and, and weird stuff was going out. Yep. And we were all amening that. Everyone was just amening and receiving everything. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. And this guy's throwing out doctrine that's contrary to the word of God. And they're swallowing it, hook, line, and sinker. So they got 90% truth, 10% lies. And then don't understand in a year from now why they're tripping up and stumbling and don't know, you know, why am I in this place? You gotta watch. You gotta know your word. Amen. See, I, I, I come up here to give you what God has given me. I'm a servant unto Christ. I come with the feed in my hand, and I'm supposed to pour out what He gave me this week for you all. But your job, your responsibility is to know your word so well. That's right. To know your God so well that you would know if I'm preaching something contrary to the word of God or if it lines up with Scripture. That's right. You can't blindly sit in a pew or in a chair and just trust that the preacher's given you everything perfectly. I'm not asking you to like judge and, and, and totally you know, be skeptical of every preacher, but you need to weigh it out. Mm -hmm. You do. Scripture says that. Right. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, getting back to my point, you are the light of the world. Whoa. Because I just got done telling you, I had one opinion about the word, remember? And it was getting a little weird there, and so we, we moved away. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but then I said to you that you're little Christ, or that you're little anointed ones, or that you're the light now of the world. Whoa, Pastor Jason. Jesus is still the light. Of course he is. The reason you're the light of the world is because you're reflecting him in you. You're part of his body. Accept it. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and literally, I mean, if he has accepted us to be part of his body, wow, <laughs> I am honored. I am blessed. I mean, he took me in when I was a wreck. And he said, sure, you can be a part of my body, but I'm going to wash you. I'm going to clean. I'm going to clip your nails. I'm going to take care of you and make you, you know, healthy. But now, and then, and now, I'm a part of his body, which means that my responsibility is to represent Christ. Amen. And this is Jesus' red letters, not Pastor Jason. You, this is when he was alive. You are the light of the world. Well, wait a minute, we just got done reading that, that Jesus, you know, the word, that there was life in him and that life was the light of the world. Hmm. But Jesus is now walking the earth, and now he's telling his disciples and the people, you are the light of the world. Amen. Oh, is that a contradiction in the Bible? You know, everybody wants to, everybody that comes against you wants to say that the Bible contradicts itself. There's no contradiction. The life that was in Christ, that was the light of men, is the same life that's in you that is the light of men. You have been called into his kingdom, and he gave you the power to become sons of God, daughters of God. Isn't that cool? That's where I would clap anyway. I don't know about you, but that's a, a, probably a spot where I would applaud the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. You allowed me to be a child of God. You let me into your kingdom and all of my misery and mess. Jesus went on to say, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, 
nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket or a cover, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And he went on to say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, what's he talking about? <laughs> let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. This is an interesting text. As I was you know, meditating on this this morning, last night, this morning, all week, I said, God, there's a lot of people in this world I've said this before, doing good works. In fact, we're in that, this, all part of the same movement, the same hour that we're living in, because people, they don't want God. They don't want a God in their country. They don't want God in their life, and they're rejecting him as much as they can, tearing down Ten Commandments, tearing down anything, crosses, statutes, anything that would even come close to representing or representing Christ. They want it gone. And at the same time as they're tearing down God out of their culture, out of their society, and out of their nation, they're also rising up and saying, look what we can do. We just had a 5K for little Susie. We raised $54,000. Look at the good works that we did. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. What's he talking about? I look all over the place and see good works. Shining before men. But where is that coming from? It's coming from a self-imposed religion that says, I don't need God. It's coming from a prideful place that actually is the, where actually the father or the God that they're serving is Satan. Because he himself said, I want to be God. Look at me. Worship me. Now that's Bible. No one can serve two masters because you'll love the one and hate the other. Well, Jason, you think they're all Satan worshipers? No. I'm not saying that they're gathering and slaughtering you know, animals on a pen pentagram or something in their wherever in a field. But by nature, they're, they're children of wrath. By nature, they're serving old Beelzebub. <laughs> they're serving the devil. Their light that's shining, listen, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's right. Come on. So do we think it's strange that in the last days that groups of people will do amazing things and good works and it'll look like, I mean, it, draw, it brings confusion upon Christians. I have looked at churches and thought, they're doctrinally off, but look at what they're doing. Wow, they're transforming their whole city. Meanwhile, the pastor's just shearing the sheep, taking the money, getting richer, building 15,000 square foot home, doesn't care for the people. There's no real truth, no real doctrine. The, 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 the people have this appearance of happiness and joy, but there's no Holy Ghost power. Amen. There's no healings, no miracles, nothing happening that would even bring light to the life that was in Christ or you. Amen? Amen. In this hour... We're in the, also in the hour. We're in a lot of hours, but it's one. So one hour. We're in one hour. We're in the last days. The Bible also predicts the great apostasy or the falling away of the church. Hmm. I, I will dare to say in my opinion, not, not this, I'm not my opinion, that we are living in that hour now. We're not waiting for the falling away. We're not waiting for the great apostasy. We're not waiting for, you know, piling up preachers and, and for truth, having a famine of truth. We're in all that right now. One time I was, I was really struggling and uh, asking God about these same questions. And I said, God, this, they appear, this church or this group of people or whatever appears to be so, so right on. I mean, they, are they of you or are they, or What? And the, the Holy Ghost just quickened me to the scripture that said, you know, how, now I'm going to mess it up. Thanks, Lord. Help me, Lord. Where the birds of prey gather. How's that go? Someone help me. Where the carcasses, Where the, carcasses the birds of prey gather. And so this is how the Lord ministered that to me. He said, be careful about all these big, famous, and you know, monumental movements or great gatherings. Because where the carcasses, the birds of prey, he said there just might be 
death there, or carcass. Oh. So that was kind of a weird way that he ministered that to me, but it made a lot of sense. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine. Hmm. Mark, I got Matthew 5, 14 through 16. I'm sorry. If we're not going to put scriptures up, I should give you where the scriptures are, huh? My apologies. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. We read that. How do you let your light shine? Where does this light come from? Well, it comes from the life that is in you, the Holy Spirit and the fire that he baptized you with. Amen. In Isaiah 60, Isaiah 60, 1 through 2. I'll give you a minute if you're on your device. Isaiah prophesies. He says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And he's prophesying about the coming of Christ. The darkness, that darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Darkness has covered the earth. Deep darkness and gross darkness. Human trafficking and molestation and, I mean, the most ungodly things that you can think of are happening. They've been happening. Probably nothing new under the sun. It's been happening, but it's just, I'm an, I have my, it's my opinion that it's being multiplied and that it's, it's getting worse. It's just in your, there you go. It's in your face now. It's being accepted. It's, it's more than being accepted. It's being embraced. It's being promoted. It's being lifted up. It won't be long, it won't be long now that people will be marrying in animals because, you know, after all, I was born to like animals, right? This is the way I was born. No, 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 you don't understand. I was born a pedophile. So why can't I marry a 10-year-old? That's the way I was born. See, we're living in a culture now. They're, they're, they're check, remember the, the DVD we just gave out or whatever it was, Six Ways to Check Your Leading? <laughs> their compass, their moral compass, is their feelings, not truth. That's right. This is dangerous. This is, what, this is how they talk. Well, that just doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> well, okay, you little, you know, pransy wansy. You get in the, well, we need a good spanking. That's what you need. You need a good spanking. Because when I was young, and it, you know, some of these things that don't feel good were put, meant to put there to make you learn things and to help you understand and to give you some direction and to give you some guidelines and to lay down some truth and some gospel in your life. We can't run around just on our feelings. When we run around on our feelings, then all, anything can go. Anything can happen. And this is the hour we're living in. America the Great, oh, how you have fallen. Oh, wait, that was Babylon the Great, how you have fallen, right? America the Great. I was reading something the other day about a study of... Um, before great empires in the, in the history of this world, great empires, before they collapsed like Rome and different places, the last thing that was on their agenda, the last thing that was happening was gender confusion. <laughs> yeah, it was happening then too. It's not anything new. See, our young people think that it's something new and they're embracing it like, well, we're just so much wiser than my parents. We were just so much wiser than my grandparents. The, listen. There's nothing new under the sun. This was happening in the days of Christ. It was happening in 700 years before Christ. In fact, we had two cities wiped off the face of the earth because it was happening called Sodom and Gomorrah. God was displeased that he even created man because of how corrupt and how evil they had become. We have to have a moral compass called the Word of God. See, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost, that life that was in Christ that was the light of man, the Spirit of God, He lives and dwells in you. If you've accepted Christ and you've been Spirit-filled and you're born again, then you have a moral compass inside you. And that moral compass will lead you and direct you and will always, always, will always lead you in this. It'll, it'll never be contrary to the Word of God. This is your moral compass, the Word of God. And pastor said, he had somebody in his church, and he asked them if they would be a part of the nursery or the uh, or cleaning team. And they said, oh, I just, I'm not, I just don't feel led. So he pulled a bullet out of his pocket. He said, here, feel this. 
He says, that's lead. Now go help out. <laughs> he needed help. Oh, I don't feel lead. Let me pray. Praying's good. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't pray. I appreciate people that take things to the prayer closet. So anyway, I said all that to say that darkness has nothing on you. Darkness could not comprehend, could not take over, could not grab a hold of, could not obtain, could not, it couldn't when it came into the world. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that men would see your good works. I'm a firm believer that your good works is a lifestyle that is lined up with the word of God. Is a lifestyle that says, I don't care if everyone at work is drinking on Friday night and telling sexual jokes and perverse jokes. I'm not going to go and be a part. I'm going to say, excuse me. I, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't like that. And walk away. Yeah, sure. Ooh, you might offend them. So what? Make a stand. Amen. Be bold. Amen. Don't care if they like you. Who, who asked you to have, who said that you had to make sure everyone liked you? Amen. Not easy to be a Christian. No. no. And it's going to get harder. And if we can't get this little bit right, it's going to get even worse. Be bold. Be a leader in your own life, wherever you go and wherever you walk. Don't, don't be offensive on purpose, right? But stand up for truth. Darkness has nothing on you. And you're living this life and the world is looking for hope and they're looking for answers. Those works, those good deeds that you're doing, that's a life that's lined up. That's a life that miracles even happen. You walk into a room, listen, the woman with the issue of blood approached Jesus and she reached out to basically steal a healing because she, you know, she wasn't supposed to be in public. The law said stoner. She was unclean. And I, I heard this earlier and I'll quit. I'm way past my time. In the days of the law, a woman that would have an issue of blood like that, if she touched anybody else, she made them unclean. Right? So I, I got an issue. You're now unclean. Now you've got to go ceremonial cleanse yourself. Well, thank God we're on this side of the cross. Amen. Because darkness has nothing on you. And now when you have somebody that's unclean or hurt or broken who is sick or needs a healing, when they touch you like when she touched Jesus, instead of him being defiled, she was healed. And that's the day that we live in. You have a light that lives in you that is the hope of the world. And his name is Jesus Christ, the word of God. And when people touch you, they're supposed to be touching you. Not like that. Touching you for healing. Drawing on you for advice. Drawing on you to be quickened. And that fire, that fiery fire, that fire that God baptized you with should go out and burn up the sin in their lives. It should go out and help that person. Healing should be springing forth from your being. Because you are little anointed ones. You are representing Christ in this world. You are now. Christ's word is the light of the world. Amen. Don't falter and be like the worldly church. That's right. Where people look at and there's no life, there's no power, there's no healings, there's no miracles. Nothing's happening but good deeds. Well, we paid off someone's bills today. Well, good for you. Is that going to get them into heaven? No. It was a nice deed. You can come pay mine too, but I need something real. I need some real, I need a real touch from Amen. heaven. Amen. I need something supernatural. Right. We need a supernatural church. Amen. Some of us live in conflict. I don't know why I wrote this. I said, I said some of you live in constant conflict like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Because uh, I was saying darkness has no, no place in you. you, you know, so, so understand you are the light of the world. The light is in you. Don't let darkness have any place. You have the choice. Now, I thank you, Lord. If you bow your heads with me. I'm done yakking. I know. I hope you got something. You are good, Lord. Well, we want to do something, and uh, I really felt strong about the Lord in this. You know, we went up and... We had, we had 150 preachers lay their hands on us. You know, they create, they did, what they did is, um, I've seen this done before, and they did it, and we don't do it a lot here. But they had like, a, they lined up these pastors, and these were hand-selected by our pastor, ones that he's in fellowship with and in relationship with. These were generals. There was a lot of authority in that room. And he lined them up, and they had all the people of the church pass through, and they just laid their hands on them and imparted anointing. And so... My wife and I are going to come up here, and I'm going to ask if you would like, how many people need anointing in their life? 
Come on now. Um, and the Bible talks a lot about impartation, anointing, and as your pastors of this house, I just want to release what we've got to you. You know, you weren't there. I wish you were. And so I'm hoping and believing we're going to just stand up here. We'll have you just pass through. Uh, it's a smaller church, so we'll just have you go through. And if God gives us, quickens us on something else, we'll pray for you. But otherwise, we'll just lay our hands on you. And believe. Believe that you receive. Amen. I don't know where she went. She got issues? Problems? Not issues. Problems in the back? Oh, human problems. Praise the Lord. We got too, too much information.